that's partly because of the uptick in corporate climate commitments, um, and most re recently because of the net zero. You're on mute, Kelly. It was working fine, and then it and then it went on mute. Not sure what happened. How about now? Yes. I love Zoom. <laughs> now that we've taken up most of our time. Okay, next slide. Without um, without further ado. So we've launched this initiative, right? Um, mobilizing voluntary carbon markets to drive climate action. Right, And the objective of this effort is to develop recommendations that incentivize credible and Paris line climate action by corporates and to inform guidance for high quality voluntary carbon markets. Next, we've met four times. Next slide. And we have this amazing facilitation team with us, most of whom you're gonna hear from today. So we have a team from Angie Impact and Alexa Kleistuber who's an independent consultant helping us. Next slide. And we're doing this all with the support of the High Tide Foundation. So um, we're covering topics like the science and the state of play in the voluntary market, the role of voluntary markets in corporate climate strategies, which is most recently net, net zero commitments, alignment with the objectives and roles of the Paris Agreement, which turns out to be <laughs> a really in-depth discussion on how these contribute to the Paris Agreement and how or whether the Paris rules are relevant. Um, we're going to move on in our next meeting to discuss uh, quality of the voluntary carbon market in the post-2020 context and to try and navigate that. And an overarching theme that's come out in these meetings is the importance um, of transparency. Next slide, please. So just so you know who we are, our steering group consists of major environmental NGOs, uh, research and policy institutions, international associations, um, all of the major voluntary market standards, and we have several key corporate advisors who are advisors to the steering group um, and won't um, be part of the recommendations, but are really helping us on the path to get there because those are the people actually looking to engage in the, in the voluntary market. Um, at today's event, we wanted to provide a peek into these ongoing discussions and, and to really provide a space to discuss how we can make the voluntary carbon market work for the climate. Um, there's a lot of interest in this right now. There's a lot of corporate action um, driving the demand for the voluntary carbon market. And we all just want to make sure that um, these are all aligned with climate action, which is where we need to go. So without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Kim Carnahan, who's going to kick us off with a framing presentation. Kim is the Director of Sustainability at Angie Impact. And most of us know Kim best um, for her former role at the State Department where she was most recently the chief negotiator on climate change. Kim, over to you. Kim? She's working on sharing her slides, one sec. No problem. Uh, Kelly, while we're waiting, do you wanna introduce yourself and uh, give a little bit of an overview of EDF's work in this space since we skipped right past that important part? Sure, yes, because we were, we were running late. I'm Kelly because I am the Associate Vice President of International Carbon Markets at EDF. Um, EDF are an organization that finds solutions that work um, with the uptick in the voluntary carbon market. We're trying to help um, both countries and companies figure out how to engage in the voluntary carbon, carbon market in a way that um, avoids supply chain risk, that where they can avoid um, accusations of greenwashing, and where they can really have the voluntary carbon market contribute to their um, corporate climate goals. Can you guys see my screen now? Okay, great. 
Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that that uh, delay. So thanks um, so much for the uh, for the introduction, Kelly, and and so great to be with all of you today to give a little bit of an update on where we are with the voluntary carbon snap carbon markets now and what's on the horizon. Um, the first trend that I want to look at for the current voluntary carbon market is simply that activity in the market is rising. Uh, in 2018, we had 98 million tons worth of approximately $296 million um, that were transacted, and that was up 53% in volume as compared to 2016. Um, the ecosystem marketplace has also reported anecdotal evidence that these buyers range from small businesses to major corporations. Uh, First-time buyers uh, can be kind of a double-edged sword, as they say, because um, they tend to focus on price over quality, uh, but they are certainly driving up the, the numbers in the market as a whole. And what we see in 2019 is that 140 million tons of voluntary carbon market offsets were issued, and that's a 200% increase over 2018. What we know about issuance is that um, project developers don't request issuance until they have buyers for the market, uh, within the market. So that means that they had demand for at least 140 million tons of voluntary carbon market, uh, voluntary carbon markets um, already, already uh, you know, done in deals before they requested that issuance. The second uh, trend that we know is that not the number of companies offsetting is increasing. That's not surprising. We've seen a plethora of big offset commitments uh, announced in the press recently. Uh, Ecosystem Marketplace has stated that demand was largely driven by new market entrants, which diverges from past years, wherein 80% of demand was driven by companies that had already offset in the past. Um, Ecosystem Marketplace also said that the increase was largely fueled by European companies, uh, which seems a little bit out of character given the less favorable reputa reputation of offsetting in Europe. Um, but it's likely an indicator that companies are coming to terms with how difficult it is to meet the very ambitious targets they set in the aftermath of the adoption of the Paris Agreement uh, with only internal emission reductions. Uh, companies are realizing that they need a phased strategy, for example, that includes using offsets to neutralize their emissions as they do the hard um, and often slow work of bringing down their internal emissions and working with their suppliers to do the same. At NG Impact, uh, we're helping a broad set of companies to do this hard work now, and, and we've seen this kind of conversation happen internally in a lot of companies as they realize that they're going to need to turn to offsetting in the short term while they work out their longer term strategies. The third trend that we're seeing is that nature-based solutions are leading the, the pack in terms of the uptick of activity in the voluntary carbon market. Uh, this boom was driven in large part by the um, IPCC's emphasis on the importance of carbon sinks in meeting the well below two degree target of the Paris Agreement. What we've seen is that forestry and land use covered 56% um, of voluntary carbon market transactions in 20, 2018, which is compared to 38% in 2017. We've also seen in 2018 that afforestation and reforestation offset volume transactions grew 342%. Um, and then we don't, we don't yet have the exact numbers for um, 2019, but we know that the boom for tree planting has, did continue last year and is continuing this year as well. A couple of other trends to focus on, projects reducing the emissions from household devices, in particular cookstoves are on the rise. Cookstove, cookstove projects increased um, uh, 200% in 2018. And the demand for large scale renewables is falling as companies began to have concerns that um, additionality is questionable in a large number of those projects. So that's what we know about trends in the voluntary carbon market today, but what's going on around it? Uh, what's shaping it going forward? Here are just a few elements, and I'll get into more detail on all of these later in the presentation. First and foremost, the lines are now blurred between the voluntary and the compliance markets. Article 6 of the Paris Agreement recognizes that parties will use quote-unquote cooperative approaches um, carbon markets or emissions trading to meet the, their nationally determined contributions, but it doesn't restrict parties to using uh, the Paris Agreement's successor to the CDM, even though um, one has been created, nor does it uh, create an emission trading system for countries to use under the Paris Agreement. Um, so <clears throat> uh, they're on their own as to figure out how they're going to use quote unquote cooperative approaches. Um, they're going to use a variety of options, including potentially aspects of the voluntary market to help them meet their goals, um, which could be prove a little complicating as we move into the world of needing to account for uh, emission reductions sold 
in the voluntary carbon market against uh, NDCs. Uh, the second way in which lines are blurring between the voluntary and the compliance markets is ICAO's Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, or CORSIA. Uh, CORSIA has recently approved four voluntary standards, um, in addition to some compliance uh, standards, for compliance. This means that the standards themselves um, are being asked to figure out how to ensure that the units that are being sold into CORSIA from those standards um, are not double counted with nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. This is a, a very tricky task for those standards uh, to undertake, and it is um, it's something that re it remains to be seen how they're going to be able to do that. Uh, another one of the issues of post 2020 complexity is that company net zero goals have skyrocketed um, in the last couple of years. You've seen a huge number of companies take on uh, these goals, but we, those companies have not yet made clear and many don't know how they're going to achieve those goals, certainly driving demand up for offsetting, but also adding uncertainty into the future of the voluntary carbon market. Uh, another issue is that near uni universal NDCs means that developing countries may hesitate to sell to other countries or to companies that want to contribute directly to achieving uh, Paris goals. Uh, another issue is that failure to agree Article 6 rule set means that there is great uncertainty in NDC offset demand. And finally, nature-based solutions um, bring inherent challenges despite the importance of those types of projects in, in meeting the climate challenge. And we'll get into all of this a little bit more as we go forward. Um, now getting into uh, the question of corporate demand at a little bit more level of detail. Uh, I'll show a couple of slides that demonstrates what, what's happening in corporate demand, and you can see by the, the list of companies on, on the screen uh, that corporates are committing to action. We have over 1,000 companies that have now taken on net zero commitments by 2050, and many have set those commitments for earlier than 2050. Um, what we don't know is how they're going to get there, and this is the second page of the list, um, and or how offsets will play into their strategy. But again, as I mentioned earlier, what NG Impact is seeing from our vantage point as an advisor to those companies in many different sectors is that offsets are playing a consistent role in helping to reduce the cost of transitioning to um, lower emissions technologies internally. They're helping companies maximize climate benefit as they ratchet, ratchet down their own emissions and gives them time to plan that kind of a transition rather than jumping into more costly emission internal emission reduction uh, uh, internal emission reduction projects uh, right away. As we with an NG Impact, we're trying to get a handle on what these commitments, uh, the, these corporate commitments might mean for offset demand to help figure out how we could play into this, um, this new world that's developing. We decided to zoom into a subset of those 1,000 companies and aggregate the total emission reductions required to achieve net zero by 2050 or earlier. We took the 54 global Fortune 500 companies that have committed to net zero and did uh, much more work than I had imagined would be necessary to estimate the total emissions of those companies combined and to take a look at what their trajectory to net zero would look like. Their total emissions today is approximately 2.5 billion tons annually, uh, and if we're including scope three emissions, and most of the targets do include most of scope three emissions. Uh, of course, we don't assume that companies are only going to use offsets to get to net zero commitments, um, but we do assume that they're going to use offsets on the way there and in sizable numbers and in some sectors more than others. Um, so what this number tells us even is that this is just one small group of companies and yet altogether they have taken on a commitment to go from 2.5 billion tons to zero uh, and they're going to use offsets on the way to getting there. So how do we guess at corporate demand? Um, offset demand over the next decade is simply highly uncertain. It's really hard to know. Uh, there is one organization, Fitch Ratings, that estimates that demand for carbon offsets, that's both the compliance and the voluntary market, is likely to outstrip supply by 2025. That's a little scary. I'm not sure that we need to be um, worried that we're not going to have anything to buy by 2025, but we need to get our strategy in place. Because one thing we know is that voluntary offset demand is going to continue to grow. Uh, big oil is definitely leading the way. Shell has committed to net zero by 2050, heavily reliant on offsets, and airlines aren't uh, far behind. Regardless of Corsia compliance needs, which we're going to get to in a moment, um, EasyJet, for example, has set is set to purchase 7.5 million tons in less than a year. Uh, One World Alliance has committed to net zero by 2050 and has stated specifically that offsets are going to be central to the achievement of that target. 
And if we look to uh, imagining a future wherein other alliances decide to jump on the bandwagon and commit to net zero by 2050, just keep in mind that passenger flights around the world are responsible for 900 million tons of CO2 just in 2018 alone. Uh, that's a lot of offsetting. Just jumping quickly to Corsia demand, because the, some of this will be coming from the traditional voluntary market. Uh, Pre-COVID estimates uh, estimated that Corsia demand was going to be between 1.6 and 3.7 billion tons between 2021 and 2035. Um, the Corsia, uh, the body that governs Corsia, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization's um, Council, the ICAO Council had decided to change the baseline of Corsia earlier this year after COVID hit uh, because the baseline had been uh, an average of 2019 and 2020 emissions. Um, they decided to change that to 2019 emissions given that 2020 emissions were, so, um, were such an anomaly compared to, to recent trends. That will, because of the downturn after, after that change in global aviation travel, um, that is going to mean that the demand for offsets in the, at least the first three years of the scheme are going to be uh, remarkably lower than we thought they were going to be. Um, but we can't expect that they will um, shoot back up after COVID recovery uh, takes place. The bigger question is whether or not Corsia um, whether or not the offset standards under Corsia are going to be going to be able to figure out how to uh, work with countries uh, to prevent double counting with NDCs. If the standards are unable to figure out a workable process, um, then in their absence, airlines are almost certainly going to turn to pre-2021 CERs from the clean development mechanism uh, to meet their, requ their compliance requirements. Uh, just let's say a little bit about what we know about NDC demand for offsets. Um, many factors converge, again, to mean great uncertainty in NDC demand. Um, the lack of Article 6 guidance under the Paris Agreement uh, means that countries are probably going to wait to see uh, what the rules say before they decide whether or not and how they're going to use uh, cooperative approaches under Paris. Uh, the failure for many countries to outline plans to meet their NDCs means they don't yet know what offsets they might need in order to meet them because they haven't, they haven't done the work to figure that out yet. Um, and then also many countries are considering revising their NDCs in 20, was supposed to be 2020, but now it's likely to be 2021 due to, due to COVID. Um, and since we don't know what those revisions are gonna look like or how much they're gonna lead to increased demand, uh, we're gonna have to wait and see. And then uh, finally, there are just simply non-transparent deals between countries. Um, you know, some of us on this, um, on this webinar know that there are currently deals between several countries to develop um, piloting projects, offset projects between countries under the Paris Agreement, but that's not public and, and likely won't be for quite some time. Um, a few things are certainly likely when it comes to NDC demand. However, demand's going to grow probably exponentially as we uh, move towards 2030 and countries see how far off they are from meeting their targets. Um, the deals are likely to be pretty large and there's not likely to be a lot of them. Uh, countries like to do things once or twice, not 20 times. Um, and forestry projects are likely still to be a preference among many countries. <clears throat> so I'm going to say a little bit more about the complexity of offsets under the Paris Agreement because some of this is relevant to conversations that we've been having uh, within the, uh, the mobilizing the voluntary carbon market um, conversation. Um, first of all, under Paris, this is just a little bit of background to make sure we all have the kind of baseline knowledge to, to engage in this discussion. Under Paris, um, all parties must put forward NDCs and account for their internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, or ITMOs, uh, that have been authorized for use towards another party's NDC. Um, there's a lot packed into that sentence. First of all, an ITMO is, it could be an offset, it could be an allowance. Um, secondly, um, authorized means the country who's, the country wherein the emission reduction is taking place has said, yes, you may use this to meet your commitment. And when you do that, I'm going to uh, do my appropriate accounting to ensure that I don't also get to take credit for that emission reduction. And uh, yes. Sorry, just one second. We had a question in the chat. What is an NDC? Oh, an NDC is a nationally determined contribution. That is the term of art used in the Paris Agreement for commitments that parties have taken on under the Paris, parties or countries have taken on under the Paris Agreement. So each country has, has taken on uh, an emission reduction commitment and, and NDC is the shorthand for that commitment. Thank you for that question. 
Um, so the type and scope of NDCs under the Paris Agreement vary wild, wildly, um, leading to the need for guidance on which emission reductions are inside the NDC and which are outside. And that's important to track progress towards meeting the NDCs. If you don't understand what the country is committing to, how can you make sure that they have done the thing that they have committed to? Um, so that's, that's an issue that we needed guidance for under the Paris Agreement, and we don't have that yet. Uh, many countries actually lean towards requiring accounting for all offsets um, used under the Paris Agreement or all ITMOs traded under the Paris Agreement, regardless of whether or not they come from inside or outside the NDC, um, partly because it, that would make it easier, and then also because it would help deal with concerns about um, uh, you know, it perverse incentives to not take on stronger NDCs so that you could continue to be able to sell emission reductions to other countries. Um, another issue is that NDCs have different time frames, and most have an end date, not a carbon budget, meaning they don't have an emission reduction target every year. They only have an emission reduction target at the end of a time period. So most NDCs are for 2030 targets. Um, this leads to the need for guidance on accounting for offset use in the non-target years because you don't want to only be meeting that target in the final year. You need to make sure that the country is kind of moving towards meeting that target every year between now and the target year. Um, and then finally, some countries insist on allowing in pre-2021 um, CERs or offsets from the clean development mechanism under the Paris Agreement, whereas other countries believe that allowing in emission reductions from before 2020 actually undercuts the ambition of the Paris Agreement and therefore should be heavily restricted. Um, and then, so th all of these things are, are kind of open questions under, under the Paris Agreement and, and under, about emission reductions under the Paris Agreement and how they can be traded between countries. And there was supposed to be guidance that we developed actually two years ago to decide how to answer all of these questions but countries were not able to agree on that guidance um, in 2018. And then they also weren't able to agree on that guidance again in 2019 at the Conference of the Parties to the Paris Agreement last year in Madrid. So we were gonna try again this year, but then the COP got postponed because of COVID. So now we're waiting yet another year to get this guidance for carbon markets under the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> So how does this relate to the voluntary market? Um, some corporations or many corporations want to contribute to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Some simply want to help countries meet their NDCs, in which case they don't really need to worry about all of those accounting questions. Others, and this is uh, undeniably a smaller amount, um, may, want, may aspire to go beyond NDCs and to contribute directly uh, towards meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement, to contribute additionally to making emission reductions um, higher than those that would be achieved just by the NDCs themselves. And if that's the case, then they also care about these questions of accounting and would want to be working with countries to figure out how they can make sure that their emission reduction commitments go above and beyond NDCs. Um, so the lack of Article 6 guidance affects the voluntary market in that way. Uh, and then it also has, uh, affects the voluntary market because historically the UN system has set benchmark quality criteria. Um, lack of guidance um, about the new market mechanism, the replacement for the clean development mechanism under the Paris Agreement, um, means that the voluntary market now is kind of making those decisions for itself. And within the mobilizing the voluntary carbon market um, initiative that, that EDF and, and High Tide have been, have been um, spearheading, uh, we're looking at those questions exactly. And this is uh, the last slide, just to say that there are a few other things that may impact uh, the voluntary market going forward. First and foremost, the US 2020 presidential election, uh, potential US regulation, um, and could impact corporate commitments. Uh, the ambition type scope and the country circumstances of the NDCs, especially as they may get updated this year or next year, is going to potentially impact the market. Uh, there are existing and emerging national and subnational carbon pricing and regulatory regimes, which could change how corporations want to interact within the voluntary carbon market. Um, private companies continuing to take these commitments. You know, you saw the two slides that list out the thousand companies with net zero commitments so far. We imagine that's only going to grow going forward. And then finally, we have emerging standards and guidance around net zero and carbon neutrality frameworks and concepts, one put out by the, by the Science-Based Targets Initiative only last week. So as these uh, developments continue, we're gonna continue to watch that and be trying to advise companies on, on how best to engage in this market going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim.
So we've had some questions in the chat and they're really good questions, but we also have a panel discussion um, coming up after the presentations. And so the panel and or Kim um, can answer any of those questions when we're having the panel discussion rather than put Kim on the spot for those really detailed questions <laughs> right now. So we're gonna come back to those, don't worry. Um, we'll just do it during the panel discussion. Uh, does anyone have clarifying questions for Kim? I don't see any hands raised. So I know it's not in our program, but we actually have a special guest. Stephen D'Onofrio is the director of Ecosystem Marketplace. Um, and if you're not familiar with the reports that come out of Ecosystem Marketplace, I, I'd say um, it's one of the reasons we know what we know about the voluntary carbon market. Um, they really are a hub uh, for producing data about the voluntary carbon market. Um, in its size, scope, and um, impact. And he's gonna be telling us right now about a special edition report that Ecosystem Marketplace has released um, during Climate Week. They're gonna release it at AIDA's North America Carbon Forum event. Um, and we're getting a bit of a sneak uh, preview of it right now. So Stephen, over to you. You should be able to share your slides and if you cannot, Krista can do it for you. Thank you. Great. Okay. I will pull these up and, and just to, you know, thank you, Kelly and team for <laughs> this late ad. We, um, we sort of realized uh, that, that this would be a good moment for us to share the 2019 calendar year data and related findings, you know, at least in a very brief, you know, moment, but want to kind of open this up because we're, we're getting a lot of different requests, you know, asking us to do different types of dives into the data. And so, um, so rather than us sort of wait until that perfect moment and also that we've been delayed this year just because of COVID as it is, we wanted to put together a very short and kind of punchy report that gets to the, the high level data that everybody's asking for, um, but also, uh, you know, gives some kind of additional thoughts and a lot of what Kim has already walked through, uh, you know, is a good scene setting. And, and so thank you for doing that. I'm just pulling up my slides. I was not sure if I was presenting or not, but let me just pull these up here and I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, and do, 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 do. One second. Okay, I, I'm not able to do it, uh, Kim. Oh, sorry, Kelly. I, is it possible, Chris, for you to do this? Um, and, and so the, the, some high level notes that <clears throat> uh, as this is opening and you can go to that, that next slide uh, is this has been a kind of a 15 year process for ecosystem marketplace. We collect this data each year. Uh, our work depends on not only our kind of core collaborators, but all of the survey respondents, all the organizations active, the project proponents, the developers, the intermediaries. Um, so, so, I mean, really, we're depending on everybody to, um, to respond to this survey in order to have anything to present. But, um, but as has been already been alluded to, price information, transaction information, understanding project categories, types, standards, all these questions are, you know, bubbling back up. And, and so what we're trying to get to is, is trying to help people figure out really what is the data telling us. Um, not so much focusing on, you know, what is sentiment telling us. And, and so just some high level things here that I think we find pretty interesting is that we canvassed the market, you know, sent out the survey as we normally do, but ended up coming back with uh, about 24% in terms of increase of new respondents. So we are we're looking into this to see are these brand new respondents never, never active before? Or is there, you know, perhaps, perhaps a widening of the market? Um, new actors that, uh, you know, will be continuing and, and maybe even more from here. <clears throat> and, uh, and then, you know, as it was talked about, these carbon neutral net zero pledges, it's, it's for sure driving a lot of this activity. And, and in the, both the data as well as the follow-up consultations, um, the, 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 the reality that we're hearing and seeing is that the, the transaction volumes have increased yet again from 2019 when we ran the, the numbers for 2018 calendar year to this year running the, the numbers for 2019 calendar year. And you can go to the next slide. Sorry, I should have mentioned. 
um, where we now have 104 million um, metric tons of, of offsets transacted uh, in the calendar year 2019. We are leaving this survey open uh, just because we've heard from others that they want to respond. They just haven't been able to get around to cleaning up their data to send in the response. So we're leaving this open for another few months to see exactly how round the 2019 calendar year data will get. Uh, so encourage anybody who hasn't yet submitted to do so, and we'll we'll send out an update, you know, of these numbers. But but I think we're seeing this encouraging kind of trend line here <clears throat> that there's transactions going on that um, that also will signal into the next slide uh, sort of an understanding of what's happening with pricing. Um, and and this is really only you know relevant once we can break it down to project categories, project types. Um, the, the main thing to see here is last year we found that forestry and land use, as Kim identified, sort of took that top spot as the number one project category. Um, whereas in, in 2019 calendar year transactions, we're seeing that renewable energy, um, a, a sort of low price renewable energy projects coming out of Asia um, were, were what dominated the market and, and ended up pushing that project category up significantly over 70% in terms of an increase from 2018 whereas uh, forestry and land use uh, project category decreased about 30% in terms of uh, transaction volumes. Um, but then comparing that also with, or, or adding in the, the additional elements of pricing and the, the price that these credits are getting in the market, we're seeing that those forestry and land use credits are getting that higher price tag. So, you know, I think this is a consistent theme that uh, product developers and intermediaries are selling um, you know, credits at different prices, of course, but, but that, that, again, can, the, the reality is that the, the project, uh, the, the buyer's market as this is expanding and we're seeing more entrants into that market um, going for those, those cheaper credits that, um, you know, are still valid, good credits, but they're, uh, they're, they're, that's what's driving that, that volume shift. Um, the external benefits are definitely being cited as a value add in terms of the buy side um, as well. So that's continuing. And then I guess uh, just the last uh, couple of slides, you can go to the next one. Um, this is just showing overall uh, market value. Uh, so that, that trend line there showing 5.5 billion, that's, that's what we've tracked you know, since the last 15 years. Um, and then showing in 2019, the $320 million value mark uh, for the voluntary carbon market. Uh, so getting close to that 2013 number. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> And, uh, and we have, of course, additional project types to, to break this down into, but this is kind of a drill down from the project category level where you can see uh, that red plus is, is, is still the kind of the number one project type uh, in terms of transaction volumes, as well as uh, total price, the average uh, uh, weighted price, $3.8 per, per ton. Uh, many will argue this is still not the right price uh, that these credits need to be at. And so we'll, we'll wait to see what happens as uh, a lot of the supply gets gobbled up by, by the demand and, and we, we can see where the, uh, the prices uh, end up evolving to. Uh, next slide, please. And then it was also raised, I think, in Kim's uh, comments about the issuances and retirements. And, uh, and we're trying to see, you know, exactly you know, how much there is this linkage between issuances and transactions. Um, the number that we see there in the 2019, I think that may have been what you were referring to, Kim, uh, in terms of what we were seeing as a potential transaction uh, volumes. We didn't really know. We weren't in a position to project what those would be for 2019 calendar year, but this is what we're seeing in terms of uh, the voluntary standards, major standards around uh, Vera, Gold Standard, Plan Vivo, and ACR and CAR. Uh, so I will, I'll finish there and just say that there's there's another kind of stream of, of work products that we're going to be producing uh, linked to this 2020 state of report series that's going to take a bit of a different shape than, than we have in past years. So anyway, thanks Kelly and Cam and everybody else for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen, for giving us that sneak peek, the overview. Does anyone have um, clarifying questions before we go to our expert panel? Um, we have some definitely substantial questions, but does anyone want to clarify anything in either of the presentations? Um, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. Alexia, let me know if you see any hands. Oh, I have a question from Mary Bell Robin. Should I just address it? Yeah, 
Um, so I'm seeing the question about forestry and land use. That's the project category, whereas Red Plus would be one project type within forestry and land use. So uh, I, d I didn't mean to if I did use those interchangeably. I don't think I did. But in the first, the earlier table, that was uh, forestry and land use. And then in the, um, the, the chart, a few slides after that was um, a breakout of a few of those product types. It was the top five project types across all categories that we wanted to show um, you know, which ones those were. Great, I don't see any other hands raised. Alexia, keep me honest. Do you see any others? Okay, without further ado, we'll turn over to our um, really amazing um, panel who can go into further depth on any of these questions. So we have Derek Brokaw, who's a senior scientist at the Stockholm Environment Institute and has over a decade, Derek, I didn't want to say how many, how long exactly, but over a decade of experience working on these issues, um, including in his previous role at the Climate Action Reserve. And Alexa Kleistuber, who's a senior advisor um, to the COP25 presidency team for Chile. Um, and Alexa was really involved in the Article 6 issues as well as transparency and enhancing global ambition. Um, prior to working with the Chilean presidency, she worked at the California Environmental Protection Agency as Deputy Secretary for Border and Intergovernmental Relations. Um, and prior to that, she was the um, negotiations coordinator for the Latin American countries. So has a lot of experience on these um, topics and we're grateful to have her on our team. We also have Alexia Kelly, who is a director of sustainability at, at NG, I guess in English, NG Impact. <laughs> Alexia has 15 years of experience working on carbon markets uh, writ large in so many different ways. I'm not gonna go into them all. Um, and was formerly the lead carbon markets negotiator for the US State Department. And last but definitely not least, we have um, Derek Forrester, who is the CEO and president of the International Emissions Trading System. System. Association. <laughs> Sorry. I wish there was an international emissions trading system. That was a bit of a Freudian slip. So welcome. <laughs> welcome. Very, very warm welcome to all of our panelists um, today. Maybe I want to ask you some very specific questions, but I think maybe we should start with some of the questions we got in the Q&A, if you don't mind. So just let me know if you're eager to answer any of those. And Kim um, and Stephen also feel free to jump in. So we have um, a question, and please forgive me if I'm destroying your name, from Dave uh, Rockland. Rockland. I'm curious about your thoughts about claims beyond net zero, um, erasing carbon re legacy like Google has made. Using current and future avoidance against past emissions seems to be a problematic claim. It shows some lack of understanding of flows and GHG longevity. Do companies really know what they are doing? Does anyone want to take that? I mean, it's quite a question. Thank you, Dave. Who's volunteering? Dirk. Do companies really know what they're doing? Well, <clears throat> so I think they do in a sense, in the sense that um, I guess I applaud the boldness in stepping forward before there's absolute perfection in terms of um, the accounting systems that need to be used and trying to really uh, uh, do their part to um, chart a new pathway for everyone else to follow. And, and so in that sense, uh, I think in voluntary methods in particular, there's always a tension between kind of uh, perfection and reasonableness or um, scaling up quickly or slowing down to get it perfectly right. And we really uh, don't have time for, you know, for the level of precision that um, some people would like. Uh, you know, I think we'll work and continuously improve, but it takes me back to, I remember, uh, I don't remember this, but back in the late 90s and early 2000s, the United States government had a um, tracking system for voluntary carbon reductions that was similar to what Stephen presented. And back in those days, the early days, there was, uh, you know, there were some people that wanted very loose accounting, like you should get credit for putting up a sticker that says to turn off the lights when you leave the room. There were other people that felt like, no, you need to make sure that you have a satellite that can measure that. Well, obviously, reasonableness is somewhere in between to get something that, in place that gets us progress. And 
when you look at where carbon markets are today and voluntary markets, the level of rigor and the standards and then third party verification and then, you know, the public commitments that companies make that thousand plus companies that Kim showed. I just think we've gone light years beyond that but because we're building each time, getting better, you know, continuously improving. But I, I sort of see these guys coming back to the question, uh, David, I see these guys as kind of out on the edge blazing trails and that we should applaud those efforts. And I'm sure they'll get better over time, but I think they, definitely are, uh, have studied uh, and, and know what they're doing um, as, as best as we can at this point in time. I could quickly jump in. I would second everything that Dirk just said. Um, and just note that I, you know, I think what the question is really asking is, what is the benchmark for corporate ambition on climate change? Um, and for years and years, it's been carbon neutrality um and now you see some examples of companies looking at well let's you know let's look at carbon negative um and you you can raise all kinds of nuanced questions about that but i think bottom line is more ambition is better um and we need to do everything we can so um you know i, I think it's headed in the right direction there may be you know there, there's some bigger questions we can ask about like now that we're entering a paris world what is what is corporate ambition need and what form should it take but um in uh, you know i think again i would second everything that dirk just said thank you derek and i'm gonna actually combine the other three questions because they're all kind of related so are offsets a realistic solution to the problem of climate change? Don't we just need to stop emitting as fast as possible? And I know that this panel is very capable of, of answering that question, but I think the related questions are, how should, how should we look at the IMA rulebook under um, Article 6 in the Paris Agreement? Um, and the question is to address critical nuances of the CDM. And I think it's, you know, to address lessons learned. And, and what do the panelists think of the role of offsetting in the science-based targets initiative? um and and how that's been framed so alexia can i turn to you to to begin answering that kind of complex set of questions absolutely kelly and thanks so much for the invitation to be here today and thanks to all the speakers and panelists it's great to see so many people on the line and such um a resurgence of interest in this topic um so i'm alexia kelly uh director in the sustainability solutions group at ng impact and um have we all collectively have been working on these markets I think, for longer than we would care to admit uh, and have watched the discussion of, evolve significantly over time. And I think this fundamental question of what is the role of offsets in the low carbon economy transition and how do we ensure that we are leveraging them to really deliver the high quality, low cost abatement where it's available. Um, while also ensuring that we don't lose focus on the imperative of decarbonizing essentially the entire global economy between in the next approximately 30 years, um, I think is a really critically important question and the one that's really at the heart of what we are all collectively working on today. So the way that we think about this question and as we engage with kind of, as Kim noted, a, a range of clients across the value chain from incredibly energy intensive energy and mining companies all the way through to relatively GHG light advisory businesses like our own, you know, where your GHG emissions profile is really coming from your data consumption, it's coming from your air travel versus direct sources of emissions um, from power plants and from energy generation. The, the pace, the scale, the cost, and the trajectory of your decarbonization is going to look really different for all of those different players. And there really is no one size fits all um, approach to decarbonization that you can just say, okay, you know, company Y tomorrow, you're just gonna turn off all these power plants and stop producing electricity because we can't emit GHGs anymore. We know that that's not a, a viable solution to the problem. We still need electricity. And unfortunately a significant portion of that electricity today is derived from fossil fuels. That's changing. Um, but it's not changing as quickly as we need it to. And so the role, I think, from our perspective that we see offsets playing is to enable us to today deliver the collective ambition that we know is necessary in order to decarbonize the global economy from a, an atmospheric level, right? So what offset markets enable us to do is to go out and find that low cost, low hanging fruit, readily available, high quality emission reductions 
regardless of where they are on the globe and really bring those to bear now while we're working through the incredibly complex, expensive, and unfortunately uh, slow transition of figuring out how do we replace all of this super capital intensive infrastructure with lower carbon alternatives. And so we, we rather than having folks sort of wait until 2050 to think about, okay, what do I do with my residual emissions, <laughs> are really working with, with clients and customers and partners to think about, okay, how do I leverage offset markets to, in, to maximize and enhance the ambition that I have as a company and that I can encourage my supply chains to undertake and that I can encourage my companies to undertake um, and our partners and really building that thoughtful and strategic um, decarbonization pathway that avails uh, ourselves collectively of all of the different levers that are available to us across the globe from a decarbonization perspective. So Kelly, obviously lots more to say there, but maybe we'll, I know uh, other, th other folks have lots of thoughts on that issue as well. Yeah, just thank you so much for that answer. And I want to turn to this sort of um, ITMO Article 6 rules question next, but I, before I do that, I just want to point out that we do have a lot of members of our steering committee um, on this call, and we are so thankful for your presence here. And we've obviously done a lot of deep diving through our initiative on these questions. So I know you thought today you could just be in listening mode. <laughs> we weren't going to ask for your active participation, but please do raise your hand if you want to jump in on any of these, because I think we've, we've learned a lot from each other on this, and um, it would be great to hear from you um, and from your part particular perspective as well. Alexa, I think I know that you know that you're going to be the person I want to speak to about the next topic, which is, you know, from your experience working in a developing country administration um, and working with a COP presidency, how do you think that corporates could best engage um, with the countries hosting these projects and programs? And, and how do you see um, the relationship of all this with Article 6 and the lessons learned from the past um, from CDM, et cetera? Great. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, everyone. It's so great to see almost 100 people on this virtual Climate Week session. Um, I wish we were in person, but we're not, and I think we're making the best of it. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for the question. I think, you know, the, looking at what, what developing countries are thinking about, um, you know, in the role, with the role of the voluntary market and meeting their, their NDCs, I think really the, the main point or the first point to, to highlight is that regardless of NDC ambition, um, all developing countries, I, you know, I think we can speak generally, are looking for private sector finance. Um, the scale that, of investment that is needed is, is immense. Uh, the IFC estimated that Paris will, will open $2.3 trillion in climate smart investment through 2030. So, you know, the scale that we're talking about is just mind blowing. Um, and it's also, I think, relevant to point out that last year, at the end of last year, there were 136 of the 168 uh, NDCs that were on the table at the time were conditional. So that means, you know, either they're looking for investments from, it could be, uh, from you know from the public sector um from they're, they're they're looking at investment you know from from a public sector in in other countries or they're looking for investment from the private sector um and so it's hard to distinguish exactly what they're looking for not everybody makes it specific you know what those conditions are but in general i think we can safely say that every country is is eager and interested in having that private investment to help enhance their ambition and especially given that that countries are expected to to ratchet up every five years you know we're coming up on that first ratcheting up period and um and so more and more they're going to be turning to to, to the private sector. Um, in the case of Chile, which I can speak to more specifically, I think, you know, it has a, that country has, the country has a very ambitious NDC. And so it's kind of, it, it's kind of a double edged sword in the, in the sense that it, it knows, you know, Chile knows it needs all the policies and measures in place to actually to really do its own its own contribution to the NDC, um, but it also knows that that the private sector isn't a separate entity from from the public. You know, a lot of the investments, for example, green hydrogen, very interested. The the public sector is very interested in using that as a way to achieve their NDC, but they want to do it in conjunction with with the private sector. Um, so they know they need that investment. They're interested in reaching out to to companies to to kind of work together in certain sectors, which I think is another key point. 
point that we we want to look to to countries themselves to say hey where where what are those sectors um, and types of projects that you're looking for that investment and where can companies come in and partner up easily um, and you know where does that bring down the cost overall of, of meeting the reductions um, so I think that's an important point that that they realize but also at the same time neither Chile nor any developing country, I think, wants to give away, quote unquote, their emissions reductions towards meeting their NDC. And in that sense, it's just really important to highlight that we are now in a totally different world than pre-2020, right? We are in the Paris Agreement world where every country has uh, a legal obligation to have an NDC and then, you know, needs to implement measures to, to meet that, um, their own measures. And so, and they will need to account towards that and say how they're meeting that NDC. So, I think every country has this new really realization that they are responsible and even if we know that the NDCs are not ambitious enough to get us where the, where we need to be I think we can we should assume that countries are taking this res responsibly and want to want to be able to account and want to be able to show their progress um, and and say how they're meeting their NDC so in that regard whether it's having an outside country partner up and buy those emissions or um, or a company in this case they want to know that that those you know that, that those reductions wh where they're going and how to account for them and I think to my last point there it's really interesting that Chile for example and I, you know I, I think many others will be doing this um, as the time moves on has its own committee now that this isn't just you know the um the, the executive board for for cdm this is not just or you know well whether it's in in those countries this is not just you know that that national one national body potentially from the ministry of environment making a, a sign off on a project chile for example, and I think many others will now kind of start to look at this term in terms of um, what they can authorize and how they do the accounting for NDCs. They're, they're partnering up amongst ministries. So the Ministry of Finance is now involved. The Ministry of Energy is, is leading the effort. The Ministry of Environment, of course, is involved. And the Ministry of Finance, of, sorry, of, um, of Foreign Affairs. So this is now a kind of cross-sectoral effort that countries are realizing that, hey, if they're going to sell emissions, whether it be to another country or to a company, they they really need to look at where they can you know harness that investment and then also be able to account for it hopefully jointly with those companies and i think companies have a lot of experience in and project developers in partnering up on on the finance and you know kind of who <laughs> who pays for what and um where the benefits go and this will just be another aspect of that looking at the ownership and the claims of those units and and you know who takes that benefit and, and how the accounting ends up working so um with that said maybe just to close the, with the question that was asked about you know how do we evolve from what's what's the evolution from CDM, um, and how do we I think it was in, you know how do especially looking at the enhanced demand that that we have and that we we want we should have hopefully uh, with the ambition now established by the Paris Agreement, um, and I think I think unfortunately it's it's evolving but maybe slower than than we'd hope um, as Kim mentioned the rule book was supposed to have been finished two years ago and is still under development. Um, but that's certainly, that particular element is definitely a piece that's being fleshed out in, in the text um, in the text currently and hopefully will be part of the final agreement. Um, I think probably the bit that speaks most to that is the section on methodologies, you know, in the new mechanism that really is looking at a bunch of new options um, that are range from best available technology to performance-based approaches to what, what we're calling ambitious benchmarking, um, which kind of really moves a, st a whole step away from a whole level away from just historical emissions um, or even just you know projected emissions. So I think that will hopefully be addressed, and that that will there will be able to kind of be a whole new scaling of efforts um, through this new six four mechanism. It's called, um, but it's certainly unfortunately we don't have the exact uh you know the exact rules yet and and i think um we'll we're, we'll just hope for the best that cop 26 can really push that piece forward and that, that that mechanism can get up and running as soon as possible thanks alexa derek i'm going to turn to you now and put you a bit on the spot <laughs> um, based on your you know experience we have some questions here about um the definition of additionality and the role of additionality um, and, and how that's being defined and some of the confusion that might be uh, causing. Based on your experience and what you're seeing now, what are the most important elements for quality post-2020 
And how is that evolving in light of the Paris Agreement? And, and how does that touch upon the, the, the key notion for all carbon markets of additionality? Yeah, uh, thanks. So um, there, there's a, kind of a number of issues, I guess, swirling around here, whether it's additionality or the other quality criteria. So, um, you know, that the criteria, the quality criteria for carbon offsets are, you know, in essence, the same as they've always been. Um, it, you know, additionality, not overestimating uh, emission reductions. Uh, having permanent emission reductions and avoiding double counting. Um, and so, you, you know, and, and what these criteria all boil down to essentially is what we call environmental integrity. It's this idea that if I buy a carbon credit and emissions end up being higher than they would have been if I had simply reduced my own emissions, or if I had invested in another carbon credit that actually met this quality criterion. Um, so if emissions would be higher than that's a violation of environmental integrity. So for example, um, you know, if I buy a credit for an emission reduction that's not additional, um, emissions will be higher than if I had invested my money in a carbon credit for a reduction that is additional. Um, and the same goes for uh, you know, all, all the other criteria. The big, I think the big difference uh, now that we're facing under the Paris Agreement is, is this situation where every country has uh, adopted an NDC, a nationally determined contribution, so every country has uh, you know, some kind of target or commitment for reducing emissions. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the complexity there. Uh, you know, the, these targets are formulated in all kinds of different ways. Um, in, and over different time periods, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact remains that there's fundamentally this question of, can I count an emission reduction as an offset? Um, does it meet the quality criteria for avoiding double counting if um, it's a reduction that's covered by a country's NDC target? Um, you know, and you can argue all kinds of nuance there uh, but I think, you know, just basically boil it down to the cab driver test. Um, you know, this company is claiming that their carbon emissions footprint is zero, um, but they're doing so on the basis of counting emission reductions that countries have already pledged to achieve. Um, I think that's going to create real issues. So whether that's additionality or not, I, I, it's a double counting issue. Um, but it's the same basic underlying questions we have with additionality. You know, additionality is like, okay, you're paying someone to reduce emissions, um, but they were going to do that anyway. So, um, are you are you really making a difference? Um, so, yeah, it, it, and these aren't new issues, right? So, I, going back to the early days of the voluntary carbon market, I would say most, if not all, of that major voluntary carbon standards took pains to, um, you know, not issue credits for reductions in countries that had taken emission reduction targets under Kyoto. Um, so, you know, that, that was on everybody's radars. Uh, I think there's been a general consensus for years that you don't count, uh, you can't count emission reductions as offsets if they occur at sources that are covered by emissions trading systems like cap and trade systems. Uh, you know, unless you back out an allowance, like if you cancel an allowance, that's the model for the, the joint implementation mechanism under Kyoto. Um, the, you know, so today the challenge is we've got this global system where we have these potential double counting concerns. And, um, and, uh, and so I, <laughs> that, that maybe this is, well, this may be a little heretical. Um, or maybe it's crazy, or maybe it's what everyone's saying, but you know, Kim was talking in her presentation about companies distinguishing between uh, contributing to countries achieving their NDCs uh, or emission reductions that go beyond uh, NDCs. And, uh, and I, I think the picture is a little bit muddier than that right now. Um, my impression is there's a lot of folks who would like to make carbon offsetting claims. Um, but they, you know, if, if they can do so um, by counting emission reductions that have already, you know, countries have already pledged to achieve, they would prefer to do that. I think that's going to create some, uh, you know, integrity, like perception, optical problems in the market. 
uh, if, if, if we go down that road. And so, um, you know, one proposal I would put forward is, uh, you know, maybe we do, and this goes back to the first question, right? What is the benchmark for corporate climate ambition? Is it carbon neutrality? Um, you know, is it carbon going carbon negative? Uh, and like I said, that's been the benchmark for years and years. It's compelling, it makes sense, but it's fundamentally arbitrary um, at anything less than the global level. Um, and what I would suggest is, you know, let's, let's maybe try to reformulate that. Let's think in terms of, you know, what can companies, voluntary actors contribute to global efforts on climate change, whether that is helping countries meet their NDCs, whether it's going beyond the NDCs. Um, you know, I, I think kind of recalibrating a bit, um, given that, you know, we, I, I, not to go on and on here, but I would say for, you know, as far back as, you know, 94, when I first started working on carbon offsets, um, we've always understood they would be a kind of interim solution that if, you know, the world collectively starts to um, take on the effort that's required, um, you know, there's not going to be that much scope for offsetting, but there's still very much scope for voluntary action. And so I think, um, you know, it, maybe we just need a little bit of uh, rethinking about what that benchmark is and looking at how carbon can, credits can substantiate and support uh, voluntary efforts to contribute to global action on climate change rather than this, you know, I've got my own little neck of the woods covered here with carbon neutrality. Um, so I'll stop there. Sorry, that's a lot. No, that's that's great. Thank you, Derek. Um, I think <clears throat> that's that's sort of the heart of where we are right now on this. And I, I'd really like to hear from Dirk and Alexia. Um, you know, so Dirk, what are you hearing from AIDA members um, about what are the most important issues facing them in their interactions with the voluntary market um, and carbon markets more broadly today? Um, and Alexia, same question to you for your clients, right? Um, between your members and Dirk Aida's members and Alexia, the clients that you work with, you're working with um, members and clients from across the spectrum. Um, and I know you both also work with governments, Fortune 500 companies, companies in, in a vast variety of sectors. So what are you hearing are the most important issues from their perspective on their decarbonization journey? And what are the things um, keeping them up at night? Are they thinking about the things that people like Derek and I are thinking about this alignment with the Paris Agreement um, and how it's going to fit into their decarbonization strategy? So, so I'll give you a little bit of flavor uh, from, from the AIDA side. First of all, I think um, uh, there's a, <clears throat> this is probably something that we share with EDF, uh, a, a huge frustration that governments haven't gotten their act together on this, on Article 6. We shouldn't be in this place right now. The, the failures at the last two COPs have really been damaging. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to do everything in our power to assist the UK uh, and Chile in preparing for the next COP to actually get this over the finish line. I think there's also uh, many of my members that are also thinking about getting beyond the COPs, right? Can we really rely on the COPs to solve all of this, or do we need to be working together to put together infrastructure that um, can accomplish a lot of the good, even if there is a failure. So um, that I think we've had, got a lot of lessons learned and a lot of infrastructure that's been built by the private registries over time, the private standards that a lot more can be built upon. Um, I share uh, Derek's view that where all this is heading is towards sort of a collision course on understanding the host country's plan of how it's going to meet its own commitment. And those need to get a lot more specific. Um, I, I love what Alexa was describing that Chile is doing of getting, you know, getting their own uh, infrastructure in place of, of what they're going to use domestically what, versus what they're going to make available for export. Um, I also think in the voluntary side of AIDA that we've got a, a whole set of people in an in a, uh, initiative within AIDA called CROA that focus on voluntary market trends. 
Um, and I think there's a view there that uh, for especially a lot of large global companies, they don't necessarily care about exporting tons out of a country. They, uh, and that's where Kim, I think you got it right on, on that slide early on, that there are some, some voluntary participants that are perfectly happy for their climate finance to assist countries in, um, in progressing their NDCs where essentially you never take the, the reduction out of the country. You may have, you might be Amazon, you might operate in a lot of different places and, and therefore have carbon responsibilities a lot of different places. Um, so I think, I think uh, we, we want to understand and be clear about uh, where the importance of this international accounting comes in and where we're getting too obsessed with uh, something that doesn't need to uh, come out of the country. Um, beyond that, the other thing I guess I'm hearing a lot more about is, and this may be for those that are involved in um, uh, as experienced traders in this, but there's a lot of discussion about whether we ought to start rating the standards or whether we ought to continue to have sort of a binary um, situation on getting an offset that's approved and you know that it's good uh, for the places that it's um, you know been uh, uh, authorized for use. Um, and I think we are leaning more toward uh, believing that there will be ratings in time, but for where we are right now, the clarity that a, a sort of a more binary system um, has a lot of advantages in building market confidence. Um, I'm, I'm hearing more calls for transparency. Um, so I'm glad Stephen's giving us some flavor of uh, uh, you know what's going on in markets. But I think for getting investment at scale, there's room for more um, uh, more gathering of facts and uh, you know protecting market sensitivities, but getting better market information, building on what Ecosystem Marketplace does, but making it even more robust, because I do think that's something that um, across the voluntary markets and compliance markets, everyone values. Um, and uh, finally, I, I don't want any of this to lead you to think that we're, um, you know, uh, easing back on wanting clear accounting standards internationally. Uh, fundamentally, this is something that countries need to do. They need to get clear. We need a transition path between sort of uh, where we are now and where we need to be when um, every country has a meaningful NDC. M more things are covered by NDCs and, and you'll uh, effectively have more commerce. I think at the end of the day, our view of net zero, which we, we support as part of the Paris Agreement, is that it's a not zero. It's net zero. That implies that everyone's doing a hell of a lot more on aggressive decarbonization. But at the end of the day, there's still some amount left in, some certain, in certain sectors that must be compensated for with removals. So that's why the nature-based side of things is so fundamentally important is we're gonna need that big time. We're gonna need technological solutions as well. But um, we need this whole package and this whole international architecture to be able to support NCS at scale and renewals at scale. So, uh, how's that, Kelly? Is that a bit near full? That is, it's great. I mean, I'm gonna actually get more of a near full because I'm gonna turn to Alexia. Alexia, let us know what you're hearing from your clients that might be the same as that. But also, what I'd love is, you know, Angie is obviously a major energy company, and and if you could give the perspective of energy companies and their use of these uh, voluntary carbon markets on, on their own decarbonization paths. I think that, that yeah. could be Thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Dirk and Derek. Um, I think this conversation really illustrates the tension that we are collectively grappling with here, which is how do we harness the vast amount of opportunity and potential and frankly expertise that's been built up in the voluntary carbon markets over the last 15 years? Like you wanna know how to decarbonize a sector, Go find somebody who's been trying to figure out how to make money at decarbonizing a sector when there was no real global price on carbon for the last 15 years. So the, all of the methodologies that have been developed under the CDM, um, the work that's been done in the at the standards around really over the course of the last two decades, working through what is a robust high quality assessment methodology for understanding where emission reductions are coming from, 
the, the amount and the volume of thought and expertise and energy and intention that has gone into building these systems up um, over the last two decades really is an incredibly important blueprint and resource for certainly many of my clients who are just at the beginning of their decarbonization journey, right? Like they've never really, many of them, many very large companies with a few notable exceptions have never actually really sought, sat down and thought through what it would really take to decarbonize their entire entire business. Um, and it's not small, you know, <laughs> fossil fuels touch every single piece of our economy, all of it. Um, and so we have to figure out a way to really do this in a, in a high quality, incredible manner. And that's some of the tension we've been talking about is just how do these interact with what, it, what is and will continue to be a very rapidly evolving policy and regulatory construct and set of circumstances, right? As countries really scale up their ambition, as they start to get serious about implementation of their decarbonization objectives. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the concern that you're hearing about making sure that we have high quality and robust accounting really stems from the fact that we've seen what happens when you don't have it. Right, so I don't know if you guys noticed in Kim's slide, there was that big chunk of Chicago climate exchange credits that then just went away. <laughs> that was really in large part because um, there was a quality problem and there was a huge amount of negative press against that work. And so we run the risk if we can't figure out a way to transparently, credibly, and with a high degree of environmental integrity, leverage offsets in this next phase of global climate action. Um, we run the risk of, of pulling the whole house down with us. Um, and so I think the balance that we're trying to strike, particularly in this next interim period, is how do we leverage every single dollar and every single um, ounce of initiative that's out there to really drive abatement at scale as quickly as possible? And how do we make sure that every single dollar that's being deployed is driving the maximum climate and environmental benefit? But how do we also do that in a way that does not impede action, that actually enables corporations to really step up and say, we have a role in this. We want to help lead the way. This is how we, we're going to put these pieces together. And so for companies like, like NG and others, you know, we really see offsets as a critically important path. Um, but we need to have rules. We need to have clarity. We need to understand um, how this is all going to work out. And we need to be doing that, I think, in conversation and in partnership with the nonprofit sector, with the private sector, and with governments. Um, none of us can solve this problem alone. And so figuring out the transparency and the, the systems and places for engagement, um, like the, the program and project that EDF has been undertaking with support from the High Tide Foundation, we really see those as incredibly critical for collectively navigating our way through what is a very complex, but also incredibly exciting opportunity for us to really advance scaled action on this challenge. Thanks, Alexia. I want to turn now to a kind of a set of questions about um, the commitments under the Paris Agreement themselves. And, um, and so I'm going to tap Kim and Alexa because of their um, continued and strong role in those discussions. But so one of the questions we've gotten is, what's the impact of the US leaving the Paris Agreement on all of this? Um, from my perspective, I'll just start by saying I hope that's a short-lived um, absence. But <laughs> I'll let Kim, Kim speak to that. And then also, how do you see, we've even, we've even been offered a crystal ball which I've always <laughs> How do you see if you had a crystal ball, how these things nest into one another, how the voluntary carbon market can contribute to these nationally um, taken uh, commitments, these country level commitments. So Kim, I'll start with you and then Alexa, to you. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, for the first question, yeah, like, like Kelly, I hope it's short lived. <laughs> um, since we won't be having uh, another COP until after the next, the next election and potentially um, a new president takes office, uh, we could actually not have a COP where the US is, is not a party to the Paris Agreement. So let's all hope for that. Um, I think how it, how it affects things, it affects everything quite a bit, I think. Um, US diplomacy is, is quite impactful and maybe I'm speaking from a bias uh, when I say that, having, having previously been the chief negotiator for the US. But um, I think two, two major things. One is that the US used its power under the Obama administration to go around and encourage other countries uh, behind the scenes to increase their ambition 
uh, the ambition of their targets. And as we're looking to see targets revised uh, this year or next year, having a strong U.S. Um, target in place, as well as a strong U.S. diplomatic effort in place to encourage other countries to increase their targets and to work with other countries and support them as they're doing that uh, would certainly make, make a notable difference, I think. Um, and the U.S.-China relationship is one where um, you would expect to see greater ambition if the U.S. and China were working together, um, and, and certainly we won't see that uh, under, under this president. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. Uh, the second one is is an interesting question. So if I had a crystal ball, how would you how would corporate BCM tie into public sector commitments under Paris? I think there are. Let me let me take a side a step back and, and answer another question. I see a couple of different ways asked in in the in the chat box. Um, I think what we've seen in our in our conversation under the mobilizing the voluntary carbon market uh, process is that there are kind of three major ways in which companies are and standards and NGOs are looking at this question of overlapping commitments between companies and countries. Um, the first way and probably maybe the most popular way or the most prevalent way is that corporate emissions are nested within uh, national inventories. And so there's, you know, some many companies think there's not a double counting problem there because they're naturally nested within um, and so the voluntary carbon market, according to that group, doesn't need to account for or deal with the countries at all because the emission reductions achieved, for example, by, com com by companies working in the UK will show up, you know, in some way in the emissions inventory of the UK. Nothing needs to happen. So to answer the question, do corporates need to report into the government? Only following their, their normal procedures. Nothing new needs to happen for the, com for the countries to capture the emission reductions happening within their country by, by companies. Um, the, 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 second the second group thinks actually the exact opposite. Um, it's not a question of the emissions being nested, it's a question of the commitments being overlapping and the claims being overlapping. And so therefore, if a company makes a, a commitment and a country makes a commitment, this, this group of, of individuals thinks that those cannot overlap and therefore every emission reduction that a company commits to, um, you know, every offset that a company purchases needs to be accompanied by a corresponding adjustment by the country within which that, that emission reduction is taking place. Um, and so that's another, another group of, of, of uh, opinions. And then the third group of opinions is kind of the middle ground. Uh, they kind of acknowledge the intellectual truth of the fact that corporate emissions are nested within, uh, within countries. But then they say that corporations have made commitments saying that they wanted to contribute to, a, you know, pushing the world towards greater climate ambition and to filling the gap between where NDCs get us in terms of emission reductions and where we need to be in terms of emission reductions to hit the Paris Agreement goals. So in other, way, in other words, the commitments that they have made at least would be perceived, and I think Derek, you were kind of getting to this, you have a perception problem, uh, would be perceived as to be additional to those countries. Um, so that group of, 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 of opinion um, would say, it's not double counting technically for a, a country or a company's commitment to overlap with the company with the countries, um, but they don't want it to. They want to voluntarily go above and beyond NDCs, um, and they want they want their commitments to be quote unquote additional to NDCs. I don't think to to speak to another question that was asked in the chat. I don't think that's necessarily the the common understanding of additionality these days. I think additionality still has its its kind of tried and true definition, which is additional to what would have happened in the absence of the project itself. And I personally don't want to change that definition. So when I say additional to NDCs, that's something greater. That's not the traditional additionality um, tests or questions that, that we would be addressing. This is something that only a certain subset of companies will, will want to ensure when they're you know, meeting their commitments. And that subset of companies will need you know, a new set of, of uh, a new system in which to engage with countries to ensure that those emission reductions that they're purchasing come with a corresponding adjustment. That's something that doesn't exist now, that that subset of companies that wants to go after that higher level of, of ambition or step, you know, greater level of ambition, they'll need to work with countries to develop that system going forward and with standards to develop that system going forward. And the last thing I'll say is just, um, that seems really hard, uh, but that system is kind of already being developed because of Corsia and Corsia is overlapped with the voluntary carbon markets. So expanding the, the system that's being developed for Corsia to other corporates who want to 
you know, go that extra mile shouldn't be that hard. And it should be something that, um, you know, a dedicated uh, process would be able to achieve, you know, in relatively little time, at least with a certain subset of countries that are engaged in and, and committed to allowing the voluntary carbon market to thrive in that way. Thanks, Kim. Alexa, did you have... Did you have more to add? Yeah, I think I think Kim covered it extremely well. So I think maybe I'll just hone in on that final point, and because it's something that we've been hearing a lot from our actual steering committee, um, many of which are here today. So just recognizing that we've gotten a lot of helpful input from them, and I think a lot of them are really emphasizing the fact that we need some sort of transition period, right? That we, you know, whether or not, you know, from these different perspectives that Kim laid out, and I think moving towards that third piece of if you if a company really wants to contribute to overall global ambition um, and going kind of beyond NDCs and really getting us to two degrees or 1.5, then they should have some element of, you know, accounting that's that's together that speaks to the UN system, you know, that speaks across the, the voluntary market and the UNFCCC Article 6 and all those, you know, that kind of that accounting framework that, that we're developing. Um, and so if they want to do that, that that's not available today uh but it but it will be you know ideally at the end of, of next year with cop 26 um and over the years as as countries actually implement more transparency and you know set up their their in, uh institutional arrangements to look at how they how they do corresponding adjustment how they do accounting you know how they work with with companies to kind of make that happen um and so I guess the, the main point is it's not going to happen overnight and everybody says, you know, maybe this would be eventually helpful or a useful system to kind of have Paris and the voluntary market speaking to each other and having transparency and encouraging ambition, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. And so it just needs to be something that we're working on together, that we're keeping lines of communication open um, between companies, between host countries. Um, you know, um, and and everyone else, uh, and and that we kind of figure out a way to how to to to, to move forward, um, you know, potentially over the next five, 10 years into a system that does have full accountability. Thanks, Alexa. I have a, oh, Derek, I'm gonna come back to you just after this. I'm gonna ask Stephen if he can answer one technical question and then I wanna give it the floor to you anyway. Um, so we've gotten a question from an anonymous attendee. How much relative investment is being put into natural and technological sequestration. So I guess removals versus reductions, rem removals versus avoidance. Do you know, Stephen, or maybe even Derek, do you know that number? Um, in terms of- in the spot. If you don't, we can come back. Don't worry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know in terms of investment, what, what that would cover. Uh, you know, I would, I would say to answer that, we'd want to look at the remote sensing technologies and other types of monitoring verification in addition to project development costs. Um, but one of the reasons why we asked a new question in the survey about um, the, the product development cost is because we're hearing time and time again that the, the prices on the market just do not um, achieve the amount that's needed to, to cover the costs yeah. on the front end of project development. So um, we'll, we'll work on putting together that data and, and seeing what we've come up with from that. Thanks, thanks Stephen. So Derek, I wanted to kind of kick you off with the final question I have for the panel before we wrap up um, and also tie it into a question I think maybe you could answer. So, you know, how do we continue to thread this needle? How do we um, find a way to get quality guidance that's clear and simple enough to not be a barrier to this investment while making sure that we're also not supporting um, greenwashing? And one of the questions we've had is, ha have you seen the use of carbon markets be actually additional additive um, actually transformative. Um, so answer that or don't, but how do you think we continue to thread this needle and how do we make sure that this is successful for climate, but also successful for the investment we know is needed? Well, maybe I'll, I'll take that in the direction I was going to go, just building off of uh, Kit, what Kim and Alexa were saying, which is, um, you know, it, it's true, we don't have an Article Six rule book. We don't have the accounting systems in place. We'll get there eventually. Um, but of course, you know, we, we live in this really murky world right now, um, where you know companies want to make these carbon offset claims, um, and there's folks like me, I guess, saying, 
um, well, wait a minute, you know, you can't make an offset claim on the basis of something that's double counted. And that's, you know, it's still happening whether we have the accounting systems there or not. Um, and I, I, so what I would say is to continue to make a plug for this idea, if companies want to invest in carbon credits that are additional, they're not overcounted, they're permanent, um, and backed by all of these um, guarantees that the you know the voluntary and other carbon offset standards always already, um, but they have double counted. Still a good thing. Like that's that's a that should be something that you know the you know corporations and the world at large, the public who care about climate change, should be able to get behind. Um, and so I, I think that's a valuable claim to make. I don't think it's an offset claim, um, but this goes back to what I was, you know, I guess, I don't know if this is threading the needle or just trying to cut the Gordian knot, but, um, you know, maybe we need to rethink carbon neutrality as the benchmark. Um, maybe we need to think in terms of, you know, voluntary actors can contribute to global goals on climate change that can take the form of, helping countries meet their NDCs um, and, you know, in, in conscious collaboration with countries. It could also take the form of going above and beyond what countries have pledged in their NDCs. And that, you know, that's where the accounting comes in um, and, and the corresponding adjustments. Um, and you could make an offsetting claim on the basis of those kinds of credits, but, um, you know, maybe we don't have to get so hung up on that. Maybe we need to think in terms of, look, you know, the goal here should be to advance collective efforts on climate change. Um, there are a number of ways that you can do that, focusing first on your own carbon footprint, um, but then also making these additional contributions. And that that would be my answer, um, you know, for what it's worth, you know, maybe that and 50 cents is a cup of coffee, but um, that, uh, you know, I, I think that's the way forward. Um, so, Thanks, yeah. Sir. So I'm going to ask for final thoughts, really 10, 15 seconds from everyone, and then just say a quick goodbye to everyone. So Alexa, final thoughts. Um, I just spoke, so I, I will yield my time. We're <laughs> Great. Derek, or sorry, Dirk. So um, first of all, fascinating discussion, and uh, thanks for leading us through it, Kelly. Um, I, I've been obsessing about uh, the one of the questions in the chat about whether any of this is transformative and, and voluntary offsetting, right? And I, I guess in, in my experience, when I really think about it, the transformation that's required of companies in changing their businesses to wean off of fossil fuels, that tends to be in the direct action that they take. And what's transformative about engaging in the offsets market voluntarily is that you're going beyond just what you can afford to do inside your fence. And I think that is, uh, yeah, gradually over time, I think we'll see more transformative things happening in the offset markets as prices rise. But it's, it's voluntary markets that have uh, demonstrated and proven a lot of the types of offsets, you know, over time that, that eventually uh, grew into use in compliance markets. So they've been kind of the trailblazers. And I think we need to unleash them to do that again and to, uh, you know, channel even greater investment at scale. But we need more clarity around some of the topics that we've been discussing today to inspire uh, uh, the business confidence to make those investments. So hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Stephen. Final thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're we're just curious to see what happens with this as well. Um, you know, the demand the demand signal is, is super strong at the moment. How that how that continues? I think all the discussions around Article Six or whether or not companies will go beyond uh, and and sort of put this put aside the need for double claiming or or you know anything else that's on the the, the the policy level and purely make this a voluntary action and uh, where other stakeholders that <clears throat> we hear often are, are challenging them. Uh, is it investors? Is it customers? You know, how the media will react, you know, ongoing you know, to, to this issue and it's going to help the market or hurt the market. Thanks, Stephen. Kim, we're over time. So I'm, I'm sorry for taking people's time. <laughs> 
Um, I'm, I'll just say that that I, I think the problems that we had have, have ahead of us are, are complex, but they're solvable. And and those of us on this you know panel and in this uh, webinar, but also all of us in the steering group and the, the, that uh, Kelly has been running are able to tackle those issues as we go forward. So I just look forward to, to working with all of you to solve these problems. Thanks, a message of hope. Alexia. Last uh, four, four words, transparency, integrity, flexibility, collaboration. I think that's a perfect note to stop on. Thank you guys so much. We're hoping the recommendations from the initiative are out in November. We're also going to be producing a series of papers, one on the science, one on the state of, um, of how um, carbon markets fit into corporate standards, um, and one on this very complex accounting piece and hopefully one on transparency. Thank you guys. And thanks for taking your time today. Um, the recording will be made available publicly. We'll send it around to everybody who registered um, and we'll also try and answer any of the questions we didn't get to offline. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks to the panel, wonderful as ever. <laughs>